Good. Thank you both of you for that. Uh, and, and, and that's good. And I think there are people that, you know, will sit in here and, and will worship the Lord and will get excited about it. And, 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 and there, there, there's a certain contingent of people that are in a really good place right now. A really good place where God is speaking, you sense his presence. It's just amazing. And then there's another category of people that would look around and say, I don't feel it. I don't sense this. I don't think what you're saying is true or I don't buy what you're doing. Maybe some of you here this morning aren't excited. Rather, you're desperate and heartbroken and lonely, angry. Who knows what the feelings are this morning, but I know they're mixed. Ella Wilcox, she coined a phrase that you will all be familiar with but the reason she coined it was an experience that she went through. She was sitting on a passenger train and she noticed something happened. She saw a woman sitting in the front of the train and she was weeping. And when I say weeping, I mean weeping, not just a tear you know, running down her cheek. She was weeping out loud. While this is happening in the front of the train, there's a man sitting in the back of the train and he's telling funny stories. And people are drawn to that. And they're laughing out loud. So you've got the, the woman weeping and the man laughing. And what happened was, eventually you started to see this migration of people move away from the weeping woman and surround the man telling funny stories. And she wrote in her journal that day, laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. So there are folks in this room who, while they're standing with a group of people, couldn't feel more alone than they are this moment. Would say, I don't feel God. I don't sense God. I'm not hearing God. I sense, in, our, in other words, that God has abandoned me. And I'm alone. And I'm weeping, maybe not physically, but certainly in my mind, because I don't hear you, God. And it's maddening. I laughed when I heard about an insane asylum where a doctor comes into the room and he sees one of his patients who's leaning up against the wall with his ear pressed to the wall, listening. And so the doctor thought, well, I'll give it a shot too. And so he stands by this guy and he puts his ear up against the wall. And he doesn't hear anything. And he said, I don't hear anything and the crazy man said I know and it's been like that all day long <laughs> do you ever feel like the crazy man listening for something that you can't hear and it's driving you mad maybe maybe you are here this morning and you're desperate to hear from God you want him to speak to you and yet if you're honest you're saying I don't sense his presence. Sometimes God leaves us in the waiting room for a lot longer than we'd like to be. And we wonder why. Well, if you feel that way, I've got good news. You're not alone. Uh, read the scriptures and you'll find loads of people who felt that way. And we'll talk about them a little bit, but I'd like to share with you just one guy a man that probably all of us respect. In fact, he's called a man after God's own heart who loved the Lord with everything in him. And yet, we're gonna see a moment in his life where he is just lamenting, shouting out to hear from God. And the good news of chapter 13 of the Psalms or the, Psalm thir the 13th Psalm is that we don't know. We don't know exactly when David wrote this, which is good. We don't know if he read it and wrote it while he's being chased by Saul, whether he's king after his sin with Bathsheba. We don't know when David wrote this, but we know what David is feeling. So if you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 13, and let's just read the King David's lament. This is his words to God. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me. O oh Lord my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. How long? How long? How long? How long? Four times. David, a man after God's own heart, is saying, when? When will you show up in my life, God? When will you speak to me? When will I see you do something in my presence? Because I don't sense you. <coughs> it may be that this is exactly what some of you are feeling today. And sometimes, before we blame God for too much, we can answer that question. Many times we can answer that question without ever blaming God for being deliberately unkind or absent. So if you're not sensing the presence of God, it may be one of these five things. It may be a consequence of your own sin. <laughs> what I mean by that is God is immutable. God doesn't change. He's moving in one direction. And if we sin, we are moving off of that path. We have walked away. It's not God who's moved, it's us. So if we don't sense him, it's because we're somebody somewhere we ought not be. It may be a uh, sin that you've committed. <laughs> it may be the consequence of a sin that somebody has committed against you. They've, they've hurt you. They've wounded you. you. You carry scars with you and they're so thick and heavy and the noise around you is so loud that you can't hear God's voice. It may be just the consequences of a fallen world. Bad things happen all the time. And they'll happen again next week and next week and next week. Part of it is our lot in life because of where we live. And there are times that the sin is so obvious and so blatant that we lose a sense of God. It may be a direct demonic oppression in your life. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of a world that we can't see. That God may have given Satan or demonic powers permission to do something in your life it always comes through him but it could be and part of that may be a sense of him leaving you but let me tell you it's not God it's your enemy and if you know anything about the demonic know this that Satan hates you he despises you the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is his intention for you. He is not your buddy. He has plans for your life, but they are not good. Or the fifth thing is that it could be, it could be that God is using a wilderness experience in your life to ready you for something to come. Paul spent three years in the desert being readied for something great. Joseph was 17 years at least in prison, not knowing why he was there. And Moses, poor Moses, oh, 40 years for him in the desert. It may be that God is just preparing you for something. But let me tell you, God is not obligated to explain himself to you. And that might make you mad, but it's just the reality of it. God is not um, obligated to make you happy. He's not obligated to explain himself to you. He is God and you are not. So David is in the midst of this desperation. And let's look at just a couple of that. Uh, let's, let's look at that just for a little bit, the cry of desperation. And we'll reread some of this. But look at it again. It says, how long, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Man. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Have you ever said that to God? 
out loud, on purpose. Ah, terrifying, really. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Have you ever said it? I have. Dozens of times. I confess, maybe I'm not as spiritual as you, but I bet you have too. When's this gonna end, God? When's it gonna stop? When is it over? Enough is enough. I don't sense you. Come on, Lord. Really? <laughs> okay, maybe I'm the only one, but I doubt it. I doubt it. How long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Then this one absolutely is amazing. How long must I take counsel in my soul? In other words, how long must I depend on me for this? How many times do I have to go to that empty well, that broken cistern that says, there is no answer. Lord, how long am I going to go into my flesh and not figure this out? How long am I going to lean on myself for answers? There was a study done by John James and Frank Cherry and they wrote a book about the recovering from grief. And in this, they talk about society's approach to grieving that leads to despair. And I think it's phenomenal. And this is what they write. They, 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 they trace the story of a little boy named Johnny. When Johnny's five years old, his dog dies. And Johnny is stunned and he, and he bursts out crying. His dog was his constant companion. It slept at the floor, uh, foot of his bed. And now the dog is gone and little Johnny is just a basket case. So Johnny's dad stammers a bit and he says, uh, don't feel bad, Johnny. We'll get you a new dog. In that one sentence, Johnny's dad is really offering the first two steps in society's grief management program. Number one, bury your feelings. It's okay, Johnny. Number two, replace your losses. We'll get you a new dog. Oh, by Saturday, you'll have forgotten about that old dog. He says, once you have the new dog, you won't even think about that old dog anymore. Later, when Johnny falls in love with a high school freshman, the world never looked brighter <laughs> until she dumps him. Suddenly, a curtain covers the sun. Johnny's heart is broken, and this time, it's big time hurt. It's not just a dog. This is a person that his heart was fixed on, and John is a wreck, but mom comes to the rescue. This time, she says, uh, with great sensitivity, don't feel bad, John. There are other fish in the sea. Bury the, plane, the pain. Replace the loss. And Johnny has steps one and two down pat now and he'll use them for the rest of his life. Much later, John's grandfather dies. The one he fished with every summer and to whom he felt close. A note was slipped to him in math class. He read the note and, and he couldn't fight off the tears and he broke down sobbing on his desk. So the teacher felt uncomfortable about it and sent him to the principal's office to grieve alone. When John's father brought him home from school, John saw his mother weeping in the living room and, and he wanted to embrace her and cry with her. But his dad said, don't, don't disturb mom just now. She needs to be alone. She'll be all right in a little while. Then the two of you can talk. The third piece of the grieving puzzle was now making sense to John. Grieve alone. So he went to his room to cry alone and he felt a deep sense of loneliness. Eventually, he buried those feelings and he replaced the loss over his grandfather with a whole host of athletic involvements. He tried his best to function normally, but he found himself many months later constantly thinking about his grandpa, the fishing trips, the Christmas Eves, uh, the birthdays. His preoccupation went on for months until he finally told his dad about it. And his dad said, John, uh, just, just give it time. Translation, time heals in and of itself. This became step four in John's understanding of grief management. Have you been keeping track? Bur bury your feelings, replace your loss, grieve alone, and give it time because time heals. Well, John gave it time and more time 
But somehow he felt trapped in a cell of sadness. What made matters worse is that he, as he relieved As he relived the relationship with his grandfather, he realized that he had never really thanked his grandpa for the fishing trips, the sack lunches, the late afternoon swims when the fish weren't biting. He'd left so many things unsaid, even the big one. Uh, I love you, grandpa. He didn't get around to saying it. John said to himself, what can I do about it now? I, I guess I'll just live with regret the rest of my life. And that became the fifth piece in this philosophy towards grief management. If there's unfinished business, plan to live with regret. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. As you can imagine, with all the trauma, John does a little elementary relational math and he reasons to himself, close relationships expose me to the possibility of deep pain. Therefore, the way to make sure that this kind of anguish is never experienced again is to keep an arm's distance from any close involvement. Translation, step six, wall up and never trust again. Don't get so close to people that their absence could hurt you deeply. The sixth step makes the conventional grief management approach complete. Let's review. Bury your feelings. Replace your losses. Grieve alone. Let time heal. Live with regrets. Never trust again. How does that sound? It sounds familiar to me. It's been society's approach for years. Now, I'm not saying that those are necessarily wrong, but they certainly are incomplete. What it is, is it's going to your own soul to try to figure out what is going on. There's never this sense of go to God Run to him with your troubles. Grieve with him. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are, who are heavy laden, who labor, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, come to me, come to me. And yet here, this is just what can I do about it? I'll trust in myself. I'll lean on my own understandings. And when you don't hear the voice of God, when you don't sense his presence, this is what you are left with. Oh God, where are you? Are you going to let me lean on my own understanding because I can't handle it? He goes on and he says, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider, listen, look, pay attention. He's begging God to hear him. Listen and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. You know what I love about this passage? Is the honesty that he knows that because he has this relationship with God that he can say what he wants to say, that he knows God has broad enough shoulders to handle his doubt. And when I look at scripture, I find men who do this all the time. Have you ever heard Jeremiah's complaint to God? Jeremiah, the great prophet, where God said, Jeremiah, hey, hey, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were born, I have this plan for you. You are going to build up and tear down. It's going to be awesome. That's what Jeremiah heard. I'm not sure God said that exactly. And yet you find Jeremiah's life is, is difficult, beyond compare. Everybody hates him. Nobody listens to him. Every sermon is like goes over like a lead balloon. People despise him. They want to kill him. They don't want to listen to him. And in Jeremiah 20, verse 7, he finally has reached the end and he speaks to God and he says, Oh, Lord, you enticed me and I was deceived. You're stronger than I am and you've prevailed. I've become a laughing stock all day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. For I hear many whispering. Terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. Say all my close friends watching for my fall, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our vengeance on him. 
And Jeremiah says, Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Oh, why? Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? Woo! You ever said that to God? He's speaking this to God. And it's a really weird passage. If you look at chapter 7, it's like, I'm mad at you, God but I can't shut up about you, God, and I love you at the same time, and I worship you. Oh, but cursed is the day that I was born. It's just like this schizophrenic, something's going on. It's crazy. You ought to read it yourself. (laughs) I love it that I can relate to guys like this. How about Job? Job, blessed beyond measure, right? Given so much, 10 children, property, uh, servants, land, blessings beyond compare. And in one day, in a matter of minutes, he loses everything. And then, if that weren't enough, Satan got permission beyond that to touch his body from from head to toe with boils. Oh, these, these... pus-filled, big old pimples all over his body, scraped him with shards of, of, of clay. Ugh. Awful. Painful. His heart is bleeding. His wife says, curse God and die. His friends are like, you must have sinned or this wouldn't have happened. I mean, his life was a total wreck. And he still worships God. But then he says... Uh, where are you, God? <clears throat> Today, my, my complaint is bitter. My, my hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him, fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in, the, in his greatness of his power? no. He would pay attention to me. There, an upright man could argue with him and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. But, behold, I go forward, but he's not there. I go backward, but I don't perceive him on the left hand when he is working. I don't behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I don't see him. I go north, south, east, west. I can't see you. Where are you, God? You've abandoned me. This is terrible. I'm in pain. Answer me. (laughs) And it's so good because guess what happens? God does answer him, doesn't he? Oh, who is this one that comes to my doorstep with words without knowledge. Sit down. Let's chat. I will ask you some questions. Where were you when I made the sun rise? Do you know where goats have babies? Do you know where I keep the thunder and the lightning and the hail? Tell me if you know you're so smart. Wait a minute, God. You just let this guy get totally throttled by Satan and now you're getting on him for complaining. Uh Uh-huh. Because God doesn't have to give you his reasoning. God is God and we are not. The thing I love about this is afterwards, Job said, oh, my bad. (laughs) I'm going to cover my mouth. And through this whole experience, he said, you know, I used to hear about God, but now I have seen him. There's something beautiful even inside of that pain. Joseph waiting for 17 years. God never explained it to him. Paul said to God, take it away, no. Take it away, no. Take it away, no. I will not take your thorn away. But God, it hurts. I know. But here's the thing, Paul. That thorn, it causes you not to lean on you. You're an intellect your knowledge, your ability, it makes you weak so that you'll depend on me. And Paul, when you're weak, then you're strong because the strength isn't from you, it's from me. So I will not remove the thorn. And Paul's response, therefore, 
I will rejoice all the more greatly for my throne because when I am weak, then I am strong. God has given this as a blessing even though it's gonna cause me to limp the rest of my life, figuratively speaking. We might think to ourselves, God, you have all the power. You could fix my situation, but you don't. Why not? <laughs> but God is working through this in his silence in the wilderness, in the waiting room, in the crucible, he's still working. Swindoll quoted somebody this week and it hit really hard on me, George Matheson in a book called Thoughts for Life's Journey. Listen closely. He says to himself, my soul, reject not the place of your prostration. It has ever been the robing room for royalty. Ask the great ones of the past what has been the spot of their prosperity and they will say it was the cold ground on which I once was lying. Ask Abraham. He will point you to the sacrifice at Moriah. Ask Joseph. He will direct to you the dungeon. Ask Moses. He will date his fortune from his danger in the Nile. Ask Ruth and she will bid you build her monument on the field of her toil. Ask David, he will tell you that his songs came in the night. Ask Job, he will remind you that God answered him out of a whirlwind. Ask Peter, he will extol his submission in the sea. Ask John, he will give the nod to the rocky island of Patmos. Ask Paul, he will attribute his inspiration to the light that struck him blind. Ask one more. Ask the Son of God. Ask him from whence came his rule over the world and he will answer from the cold ground on which I was lying, the Gethsemane ground. I received my scepter there. You too, my soul, shall be gar garlanded by Gethsemane. The cup you would have to pass from you will be your crown in the sweet by and by. The hour of your loneliness will perfect you. The day of your depression will delight you. It is your desert that will break forth into singing. It is the trees of your silent forest that will clap their hands. Oh, that is so good. One man wrote this, not now, but in the coming years. It may be in the better land. We'll read the meaning of our tears. And there, sometime, we'll understand. We'll catch the broken threads again and finish what we here began. Heaven will the mysteries explain. And then, ah, then, we'll understand. God knows the way. He holds the key. He guides with unerring hand. Sometime, with tearless eyes, we'll see. <laughs> yes, there, up there, will understand. God has a plan. Listen to this. God is never silent, but he is often quiet. He's always speaking. Do you have one of these? Open it up. His thoughts to you. He is always speaking. In his word, through people and circumstances and sunrises and sunsets and mountainscapes and ocean shores, he is speaking all the time. Amen. But he doesn't always speak loudly. Oh, your flesh, it cries aloud, right? The world clouds and clutters. Your sin covers your ears and calluses your heart. The demonic masquerades, your friendships, your affections, your addictions, your schedule, they can all crowd into your life and crowd God out of it. Could it be that God is speaking but you're just too noisy to hear him? You're running 100 miles an hour. Take your foot off the gas for just a minute, would you? And rest and listen and be still and know that he is God because he's speaking. But he's a gentleman. It's that story of Elijah, right? Elijah, great prophet of God, 
<laughs> God gifted him in amazing ways. It's not going to rain, guys. And it didn't. Hey, it's about to rain. And it did. Hey, let's gather a whole bunch of Israelites together. Prophets of Baal against me. We'll make a sacrifice. Your God can maybe answer, but I know my God will. And whichever God answers by fire, that's the one that we'll believe in. And God answered by fire in Elijah's life. <laughs> Slicked up the whole sacrifice. He ordered that all the prophets of Baal be killed. It was an awesome day for him. <laughs> and then one woman... Jezebel approaches him and says, hey, you're going to be dead tomorrow. And his whole world fell apart. Oh, no. Jezebel yelled at me. It's not fair. And he runs away and he runs and he runs and he runs and he runs and he tries to escape and he hides under a broom tree. And God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Well, God... I'm the only one that's left. Everybody else, you know, ran away or died. I'm the only one that's true to you. God fed him and gave him rest and fed him and gave him rest and fed him and gave him rest and said, Elijah, why don't you step outside of that cave for a minute and I'm gonna pass by. And he comes by in this massive wind, tornado, then an earthquake shaking the very mountains and a fire that's massive and terrifying. But it says the Lord wasn't in the wind and the Lord wasn't in the earthquake and the Lord wasn't in the fire. But then he spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. What are you doing here, Elijah? A still, small voice. God doesn't always speak in the thunder and the lightning and the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the fire, but he whispers your name. Do you hear him? Or are you so inundated by noise and, and activity that you're deaf to it? I love what Marilyn Chandler writes in a paper she wrote called Silence is to Dwell In. It's so good, listen. She says, somewhere on the dusty shelf of books I read, I read to my children when they were young is a little volume called A Hole is to Dig. Each charmingly illustrated page declares the purpose of something. A pile of leaves is to jump in. A mud puddle is to splash in. And so on. The reasoning is sound. <laughs> if you're a child... The world is made for our general entertainment. It gives us things to do and pleasures to revel in. There's something rather poignant about reading the book, though, as an adult, <laughs> having developed a much more pragmatic sense of the purposes of things, like holes. Holes are to be filled before someone trips in them and sues you. Piles of leaves are to be put into plastic bags before Thursday pickup. And mud, oh mud, that's to be scraped off of the bottom of your shoes before you walk on my nice white carpet. The same pragmatism that turns a tired and jaundiced eye towards holes and mud seems to inform the liturgical sensibilities reflected in churches I've attended of late. On the purpose of silence, Silence, it seems, is to be filled. Perhaps it would help us to hear more regularly the story of Elijah waiting for the Lord to pass by. The Lord was not in the great wind. He wasn't in the earthquake or the fire, but in the sound of sheer silence. The church's long history of contemp contemplative practice seems to suggest that there is some knowledge of God that can come only in stillness. Silence, large and long and intentional enough to open a sacred space for the Holy One to enter. Oh, maybe God is speaking in a whisper. He's not silent. He's just not loud. 
tune my heart, Lord, to sing your grace like, a, like an instrument that would sound beautiful, like a radio that would be tuned rightly. You know, there, there, there are sound waves that are going through this place. And if I had a radio receiver right now and I turned it on and I turned the knob, remember those things that you used to have on radios? And you turn that and it would crackle a little bit and then it would get locked on a station where the sound waves was perfect and you would hear what's going through what you can't hear now. Your heart is like that. You tune your heart to hear from God. Some of you are just out of tune. Turn the knob just, just a touch and you might hear him. Or maybe, maybe for some of you, your heart is so calloused because you've heard this over and over and over again. This is why it's so dangerous for you to be here today. You know that. It's a risky thing to come into God's house because God is speaking and he's telling you something. And if you hear it and you don't obey it, then what happens is a callus forms on your heart and you hear it again and the callus thickens and thickens and thickens until it's so thick that God would have to shout just to get your attention or to cut that callus away and cause pain. If you hear his voice, the writer of Hebrews says, do not harden your heart. Be careful. Guard your steps when you come into the house of God because he's speaking and what he's saying, he wants a response to. The question is, what is he saying, right? Oh, he's saying a lot of things. But could it be, could it be that he speaks, that he speaks a word from Isaiah Isaiah 49, here is God's word for you this morning. Are you ready? So beautiful. He says this. Get the picture, okay? Can a woman forget her nursing child? Would that ever happen? You have a newborn baby who's dependent on you for its nourishment, and there is that child nursing from you is it possible to forget that child? This is the question. What's the answer? Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Answer, are you ready? Isaiah, even these may forget. What? You mean a mother could forget? Yes, a mother could forget. It seems strange, but it's true. And God says, yet I will not forget you. Why? Ready for this? I hope your Bible's there because you're ahead of me. This is so good. Behold, he says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. <laughs> he has engraved us on the palms of his hand. Do you know what the word engraved means? To carve, to cut. And not just your names, but your images. God has your picture on his hand. He will not forget you. He didn't forsake David. He won't forsake you in whatever it is that you're going through. He looks at his hands and there you are. Is that amazing? It is amazing to me. This is what God is saying to us and this is what God is saying to David. And so there is this sense of consolation and I love how David turns the page. Look at the consolation of dependence. He says this. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. Look at that first word, but. I love the buts in the Bible. You know why? Because the buts are big in the Bible and the buts do something. The buts in the Bible, they turn a page. They reveal a new chapter. It's a change in attitude. It introduces a whole new scene. This is my life. I don't hear you, God, but. Turn the page, new chapter, new scene, but I'm going to let you be God. I'm going to allow you to do what you want to do. I have trusted in you. I read this about a violin player. He says, I have on, the, on my table a violin string, and it's free. 
I twist it at one end and the other responds, it is free. But it is not free to do what a violin string is supposed to do, produce music. So I take it and I fix it to my violin and I tighten it until it is taut. Only then is it free to make music. I am saying with David, Lord, I, I don't understand all this, but I'm going to put myself in a position where you can stretch me, you can tune me, you can, you can reveal things to me. I am going to allow you to do that. I'm going to put myself in the position to trust in your unfailing love. James 1 says this. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and steadfastness having its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, James is saying, let the, let the silence, let the difficulty, let the waiting room experience do something in your life. Let steadfastness do its work on you. Allow God to, 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 to carve you to, 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 to form you, to, to make you, allow the crucible to do its work. I love what Oswald Chambers says. He's such a good writer. Listen to this. This is for you. God, God can never make me wine, not wine like boo-hoo, but wine like you drink. God can never make me wine if I object to the fingers he uses to crush me. If God would only crush me with his own fingers and say, now, my son, I am going to make you broken bread and poured out wine in a particular way and everyone will know what I'm doing. But when he uses someone who's not a Christian or someone I particularly dislike or some set of circumstances which I, I said I would never submit to and he begins to make these the crushers, I object I must never choose the scene of my own martyrdom. Oh, that's good. Nor must I choose the things God will use in order to make me broken bread and poured out wine. His own son did not choose. God chose for his son that he should have a devil in his company for three years. Let God do as he likes. If you are ever going to be wine to drink, you must be crushed. Grapes cannot be drunk. Grapes are only wine when they have been crushed. I wonder what kind of coarse finger and thumb God has been using to squeeze you. And you have been like a marble and escaped. You're not ripe yet. And if God has squeezed you, the wine that came out would be one of remarkable bitterness. Let God go on with his crushing because it will work his purposes in the end. God, I don't sense you, but I know you're working. By faith, I know that. And so, Lord, even if you slay me, yet will I trust in you. My hope is in you, in your steadfast love. You know what, guys? God loves you. God does have a plan for you. And maybe, just maybe, he knows something you don't know. Maybe he knows the end from the beginning. Maybe he sees that that which you really want will destroy you. <laughs> I love the story that James Dobson tells about a science experiment that he and his daughter were doing. His daughter said, Dad, I want to experiment with hamsters. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to experiment with hamsters? She did. So they got curly-haired hamsters, which I didn't even know exist, uh, brown-haired hamsters and white-haired hamsters, and they were going to mix them all up, and they were going to do that. And he said, what we ended up with was 17 hamsters. <laughs> he said, and there was one hamster in particular. This hamster was a rebel, and he wanted more than anything to get out of that cage. He's sick of the, you know, the wheel going around. He wanted to go see the world. He wanted some action. And he knew that the gate had something to do with it. But he had no idea how to operate that thing. And so there he was just at the gate, wanting so badly to get out. 
And Dobson says, but there was something else going on. If you were in the room, you would have seen this, this hamster wanting to get out. But then lurking over in the shadows was our dog. And he too wanted freedom for the hamster. Because as soon as the hamster was let out, he would become food for the dog. And the reason he didn't let him out was to protect him. Now, how many of us are like that hamster? God, just get me out of this situation. Let me out. I'm tired of what I'm going through. Now's the time. Let me out. And if he opens the door, you're dead in a minute. Because it's not God's will that you get out sometime. So, his next verse is so good. The reason, when he sees what God is doing and he, and he trusts in God's unfailing love and when he knows that God has a plan, he says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I love this. Do you see what he's doing right now? He is seeing beyond the temporary. Okay, Lord, my life may not go well, may not end well. The thorn may never be removed. I may deal with this for the rest of my life, but this isn't all there is. You guys know that, right? Salvation. Do you know what that means? We've been saved from something, for something, to something. One of these days, it will be revealed that God has a plan that is far beyond anything that I could describe to you. Eye is not seen and ear is not heard and mind is not conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I can't think the thought. I can't come up with a word. My eyes have never seen what God has for us. This is coming. This is the reality that's more real than where you're at right now. Listen to 1 Peter 1. 3 through 7. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are, be are being guarded through faith for a salvation to be revealed. <laughs> One of these days, we're going to see what that was all about. In this, you rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're a born-again child of God, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then what you have to look forward to is amazing. It's hope. It's hope that doesn't disappoint. Like Paul says in Romans 5, hope doesn't disappoint. I know it's gonna happen. One of these days, I will see God. I will see what he's planned for me and so will you. And if this is true, if we know this is true and this is true, what would that cause you to do? To rejoice, to sing. He says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt with bountifully with me. Oh, you guys ought to be a singing congregation. Do you know that? Some of you are like, I don't like to sing. Just give me, the, give me the sermon. I don't need to sing. I don't like to do that. Oh, you do. You do. You need to express yourself to God because he loves that. You know, singing is mentioned 400 times in the Bible. Did you know that God sings over us? Can you imagine that day? He will sing over you. What kind of voice does God have? He's into singing. He wants us to sing. John and Charles Wesley wrote 6,500 hymns, and this is what he says about singing. Are you ready? He says, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were, beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep. Oh, is that some of you this morning? Half dead, half asleep. Beware of that. Be careful. But, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of it being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Oh, right? Have you ever turned on the radio? Hit scan and it landed on a song you used to know and you know it and you sing it Woo! I love to sing those songs and I'm not ashamed of anybody hearing me I can sing those songs 
And so can you. I've seen you in your car. I know you can. Why can't we do that with the songs of God, the ones that are teaching us about who he is and telling us to sing unto him? We can trust him even when we can't hear him. And I'll say with Job what Job said, but he knows the way. Even if I can't find him, but he knows the way I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. God is working in the silence, in the whisper. And one of these days, he'll be finished and it will be revealed who we are. So trust him in the silence. Trust him in the waiting room. He knows what he's doing. And think again one more time as we begin to move into the Easter season. Remember, remember the night that Jesus was betrayed. What was he doing? Do you think his prayer sounded a little bit like David's? Mark chapter 14, listen to what it says. They went to the place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Ek the ambeo. Ek the ambeo. What does that word mean? To be terrified, alarmed, it was happening to him right then. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, anguish, grieve all around to the point of death. Luke records that his, 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 his sweat turned into drops of blood because there was so much anguish going on in his mind. And three times he said, Lord, if it's possible... Take this cup from me, the cup of wrath. Take it away. No. If there's any other way, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not your will, but mine be done. And, and I don't know if Father spoke to him or if it was just silent. And he turned around and he woke up his sleeping disciples and he said, look, the betrayer's coming. And he submitted to it all the way to the cross. All the way to the cross. And they nailed him to a cross. And you know why? For the joy set before him. <laughs> he scorned the shame, enduring the cross. What's the joy set before him? You are. I am. The glory of God is. <laughs> if Jesus can do it in that way, can't we? You know, God can be trusted. So let's sing to him, all right? Let's pray.